If you think desperate times call for desperate measures, you might want to think again. I'll be right back. Hey there, Gracious Gang. It's Mike from TheGraciousGuest.org here with you for another movie review. I haven't done one of these in a while. Uh, but before we dive right in, I want to just uh, encourage you to make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Subscribe uh, by clicking down there where it says subscribe. You can like this content. Please click the little thumbs up. Uh, just do that now. That really helps uh, get interest generated in the video. And uh, also make sure you share this. Share this far and wide. I think there might be a couple reasons to share it. Uh, I, I really am excited for this uh, particular episode today. And so thank you for joining me here today. The Gracious Guest Show is a place where uh, I do interviews and occasionally I do uh, uh, kind of fly solo like I'm doing here today. Uh, in this case, you know, trying to glean as best we can really meaningful things, right? meaningful takeaways from what we watch, what we read, what we listen to, um, trying to encourage people, myself first and foremost, and then encourage others to try to do a better job paying attention to just what's going on around us each day. Uh, life is flying by so quickly, sometimes we take that for granted. Um, the sort of high-paced world that we live in, the, the sort of social media atmosphere really tends to, you know, make us be dull, I think, a little bit, uh, to kind of miss details. You know, you're just kind of waiting for the next bullet point, the next thing. And so, uh, you know, what I like to do around here is to tap the brakes a little bit and examine things a little bit more thoughtfully um, from a perspective of, of uh, in my case, a you know, Catholic perspective, a broader Christian perspective. And um, I think you're going to get a lot of, of uh, interesting insight here today in this uh, this movie review. I do want to share the reason I'm doing this is, uh, is, is very personal for me. It's something that uh, uh, I really wanted to uh, to do and to put together. And uh, this movie in particular, Changing Lanes, you know, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, it came out 20 years ago. Why are you doing a review of that now? Uh, first of all, I didn't have this show 20 years ago. I didn't have this technology 20 years ago. I didn't see this movie, actually, when it came out. I remember very vividly seeing ads for it, being moderately intrigued in it, you know, but uh, you also didn't have the availability of streaming it and getting it on demand later on. Um, I never rented it back when you could go to rental stores, if you guys remember those things, and uh, just sort of slipped into the background. And a couple of years ago, my brother Joe, uh, who passed away uh, at the time of this recording, uh, last September, September 2021, uh, Joe saw this. I guess he'd seen it on uh, Amazon or Netflix or somewhere. You know, He streamed it a couple of years ago, and see, he was in a similar boat. I don't think he had ever seen it before. And he asked me about it. He said, you remember Changing Lanes? Did you ever see Changing Lanes? And I said, no, but I know what you're talking about. I could see the, the poster. I could see the, the trailer in my mind for whatever reason. And uh, he's like, he's like, it's, it's pretty good. And he, and he was kind of cueing me into this. He said, there's a lot of uh, faith content in it. And, um, and he was trying hard not to spoil it. You know, so he really wanted to talk about it. And, and uh, it was like, just, just watch it. He's like, just watch it, you know, and, and, and we should, you know, have a chat about that. Maybe we could do a show on that. And I was like, yeah, sure, you know. So it wasn't too long after that I managed to get around to seeing it. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, he's so right. And I jotted all this stuff down. Here's my note sheet right here. Just on, I had a little little memo pad. And um, I captured a couple things on there. And uh, we were, you know, tentatively, we didn't have a date set or anything. But, you know, Joe and I were, were tentatively planning on doing a review, a sit down and a chat about this movie. And unfortunately, it was um, uh, not to be because he, he passed away not long after that. And so I, I've been thinking about it, you know, here and there last couple months. Uh, his birthday is is today, the day of the release of this video. I'm recording it a few days earlier. Um, and I just thought that would be a, a special tribute, I think, to him. So you see him on the, the cover art. And um, I know he's he's here with me. Um, and I was just saying a little prayer too before we got started. I was like, yeah, help help me out on this a little bit, you know, because I know we we did chat about it a little afterwards, but we weren't recording it. So I know um, I, I think I can speak for both of us and really kind of looking at some really interesting things in this this movie that are worth considering. So that's why I'm doing it today, and I hope you hope you enjoy. I hope you'll share it. Okay. So this movie, I, I have some notes up here. Um, this is a film. 
Uh, it's directed by Roger Mitchell, and um, the screenplay was actually, uh, the story was by a guy named Chap Taylor. I don't know much about Chap Taylor, an interesting name. And uh, Michael Tolkien, not to be confused with Tolkien, it's T-O-L-K-I-N. Interestingly enough, when I sat down to, to get this ready for today, uh, that name sounded really familiar. And again, at the time of this recording, relatively recently, Paramount Plus released their 10-part uh, series, The Offer, which is a fictionalized, somewhat loosely based on reality, but there's a lot of license taken with it, a show about the making of the original Godfather film, and Michael Tolkien is the creator of that whole show. Um, so he's he's definitely um, very talented. Uh, I do have to warn you, if you're going to watch that show, there's uh, an awful lot of language that uh, parents definitely will not want their, their children uh, seeing. There is some in this movie as well. Uh, this film is, um, what is it here? I think it was rated R. Um, I should have had that up here, but, um, let me just, let me just double check that real quick. That'd be good to know. Changing lanes rating. I think it's R, but it's like 2002 R, which is like, so it's a 2002 film. Uh, it's, it's categorized as a thriller slash drama. And it was difficult to explain. People were telling about this, you know, a couple of days ago, cause my wife and I watched it together, uh, rewatched it a couple of days ago. She hadn't seen it before and we were trying to figure out, you know, um, how do you describe it? You know, it's an action. It's not really an action movie. There's action in it. Like, you know, what do you, what do you do? So, um, bottom line, uh, this is, um, there's some, you know, kind of adult references in it. You know, if, if you're thinking of watching this with a younger audience, there's, um, I think eight or nine, uh, F words used in it. I think half of them are in one scene when someone's particularly upset. So, you know, you can check out if, if you're a parent or someone who might be thinking about watching this who's not really sure about uh, certain content and that sort of stuff. Uh, you can certainly do a little Google search and get more details on the specific references to stuff that might be, you know, uh, morally objectionable to you. But, you know, so fair enough, little disclaimer on it. This came out, uh, as I said, in 2002, and uh, it stars Ben Affleck. Uh, and Samuel L. Jackson, okay? Uh, ben Affleck's a, uh, an attorney. His name's Gavin, uh, Gavin Bannock. He's a young, uh, up-and-coming attorney in New York City, and he's juxtaposed and really contrasted with this character, Doyle Gibson, who's played by Sam Jackson, who is an uh, insurance salesman uh, who's sort of a recovering alcoholic. He's having a lot of family problems. His wife is um, in the process of, of getting ready to leave and move to Oregon with their two sons. He's desperately trying to prevent that from happening. Um, you get the, really early on, you get this, this, um, uh, understanding of, of just how much he loves his sons. He's, he's really doing everything seemingly he can to hold his family together. And you get these just, you know, sort of back and forth images of or, you know, little clips of how different these two guys' lives are in a lot of ways, you know, so you see, his, his turmoil and his struggle. Meanwhile, you see Ben Affleck's character, uh, Gavin, is a, a young attorney trying to make partner at his law firm. The law firm is run by his father-in-law um, and his father-in-law's partner. And they are basically, right at the beginning of the movie, you see him speaking to sort of a music conservatory. There's, there's you know, kids there. It's like this um, foundation that he represents where the man who founded the foundation has passed away recently and is, has left this enormous endowment, basically, to help with, um, you know, teaching kids music and, and all these, these good efforts. You know, you get the um, little window into this legal, philanthropic kind of world that he's living in. And it seems very idyllic and everything. But very soon you see that there's something uh, awry because as he leaves, goes out to the cab, um, or I'm sorry, goes outside to where the cabs are, uh, there was a young woman who he referenced in the sort of ceremony inside who is the granddaughter of this philanthropist who's left all this money. And she seems very upset with him and says, I'll see you in court. You know, and he's like, I didn't do anything wrong. And you're like, what's going on? Well, you come to find out as these two stories start to converge, right, that Sam Jackson is on his way to the courthouse to try to make his appeal to get joint custody for the sons, while Ben Affleck's character is on his way to the courthouse to do whatever. We don't know what yet. And they get in a car accident. Gavin, Ben Affleck, Gavin accidentally cuts Doyle off because he's being negligent, he's not paying attention. They're both kind of distracted. And they get in this accident out on the freeway. And Gavin's all worked up because he's running late to the courthouse. He needs to get there for this big, important thing. Can't find his insurance card. Sam Jackson, who's an insurance agent, is telling him, like, you should really have your insurance card handy, you know. And so 
he's trying to be uh, polite, and Ben Affleck's getting all worked up, and uh, writes him a blank check. He says, "Oh, you get your car fixed, all this," and and Samuel Jackson's like, "Yo, like you know, we got to do this right. We got to you know make this right. We got to do this the right way." His car, Gavin, uh, Gavin's car, Ben Affleck uh, is fine. He can drive. He can leave the scene. Doyle's, however, is not fine. He can't move it from the scene. Doyle is is pleading with him. He says, you can't just leave me here. He goes, here, here's a check. Take care of your car. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. And Gavin jumps back in his, his bends and just takes off. Leaves the scene of the accident. Well, of course, um, Doyle uh, is late to court. Um, I should back up. As he leaves, Doyle looks down and sees a folder laying on the ground. Uh, when uh, Gavin was filling out the check to give to him, he used a folder from his briefcase and then accidentally forgot the folder. So now Doyle... Sam Jackson has the folder. Gavin is without the folder. Okay. Um, there's so many interesting things. Right at the beginning of this movie, you find out that it's Good Friday. And there's a couple things to this. You're like, why speci- Why be so specific? Like, you could make this movie take place on any day. The fact that it, they zoom in and emphasize that it's taking place on Good Friday. Right? The day of, of Christ's ultimate suffering and his death on the cross. Uh, is very intriguing, to say the least. And so... Uh, even in that scene, right, Doyle is, is appealing to Gavin. He's saying, we got to do this right. We have to do this the right way. That's very important to him. Um, so he doesn't do it, of course. Uh, Gavin doesn't. Gets to the courthouse. He goes in, and you find out that what's going on is that there was a board of trustees that that philanthropist had sort of in place helping him with this, this huge um, uh, philanthropic work he was doing. And when he died, he signed a power of attorney that basically gives sole control of all of that foundation money, you know, many, 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 uh, what's that? it's like a hundred million dollars or something like that to the law firm. The granddaughter's upset about that. She's like, these board members, these were his friends. Why would he do this? And Ben Affleck representing a law firm is saying it's legal. Here's the power of attorney right here. He didn't think they were, tr- they were his friends, but he didn't trust them to administer this after his death. And so he says very proud, proudly, he goes, we, you know, here are the documents. We have this, we have that. And here's the power of attorney giving all of this, this uh, money over to the, such and such law firm. And he doesn't have it. And he realizes. And it's this really funny moment. Uh, I had on this note, he expresses sorrow, right? You know, I'm sorry, I don't have it. I don't have the, the document. Um, and the judge is not really interested in his apology. She's saying, you got to have this document. And he says, okay. So she gives him um, this mandate, he basically has to bring that paperwork back by the end of the day. Uh, or he could potentially face jail time, because this is very, very serious stuff they're dealing with here. So he's embarrassed, he leaves. Uh, right away, I've noticed this idea of, of an apology is one thing. I, I get this with my daughter all the time, especially uh, my, my five-year-old specifically. She'll say, she'll do something, she'll be sorry. I believe she's sorry. She says, she says she's sorry, but an apology saying you're sorry is not sufficient, you know, and I'm thinking about this in the life of faith. I mean, I, I tell God I'm sorry all the time. I, he believes me. God knows when I'm sincere. God loves me. His, his mercy is infinite. B- but that wrong that's been done needs to be made right. And ultimately, it's only Christ who can make it right. But I have to do something to participate with his action of, of making amends somehow. I can't just, oh, I'm sorry for breaking your window, and then the window stays broken. The window needs to be repaired. So, you know, Christ doesn't just take away the stuff we did wrong. You know, he doesn't just, like, give you an excuse. You, know, you did a wrong thing, you broke, broke the law, uh, you committed a sin. He provides the means of actually restoring and healing the wound. So that's an important thought. Another thing is sin only gains momentum. And boy, do we see that. I mean, this movie, if you have to break it down, is, is really, I think, about desperation. <laughs> because what happens is, long story short, and there's a lot of, I don't want to give every little detail away, but Gavin and Doyle end up in this just cyclone of disaster. As they they encounter each other outside the courthouse, Doyle, of course, is too late for his hearing, and, and they give custody to the mother, and he's just completely a broken man. He's walking down the street in the rain. Uh, Gavin sees him and he's trying to apologize out of the car. You know, what can I do to make it right? Tries to offer money and, um, Doyle chides him, you know, and holds him up against the car and everything. When you know, he gets out and he's like, I want my time back. You know, you think this is about money? I need my time back. I need the 20 minutes back that you took from me that made me too late to get custody for my sons. Can you give me that? You know? And, uh, 
he is, uh, you know, and, and Gavin's frustrated. He goes, well, do you have the file? Do you have the file? And he's like, I threw it away. Because he got frustrated after his, his hearing didn't happen. He just threw it in the trash can outside the courthouse. So Gavin's just, you know, beside himself. And he, he's trying to figure out what to do. He heads back to the law firm. Uh, the secretary at the law firm, um, and I don't think she's a secretary, actually. I think she's another attorney, but, but um, uh, I don't know exactly her role there, but she's not one of the partners. And um, you find out that he's been having, had been having an affair with her. She's sort of an advisor to him and everything. And they kind of chat a lot through it. And she's kind of warning him about certain things because uh, as he starts to consider more and more illegal means of what he can pursue, she's trying to give him a heads up. Like, you know, you you know what road you're heading down here, right? This isn't going to get better. But by the same token, she's providing him with, you know, some advice that, that might lead him down that road too. So she's definitely not uh, um, innocent in all this. So Doyle goes back, he kind of has a change of heart, rifles through the trash can, finds the file. Um, and there's these moments all through it where it's just so tense because it's like one of them is having like a repentant moment and they're about to reach out to the other, but then something that the other one does to take revenge on them prompts them to take a revenge move. And, um, you also get William Hurt, who's a phenomenal actor. He's Doyle's uh, sponsor for Alcoholics Anonymous. You see him a couple times through the film trying to help Doyle process what's going on, trying to help him prevent letting his despair lead him back down the road of, of addictive behavior. Uh, then you have uh, Gavin, the attorney, you know, he's trying to figure out what to do. He First, he lies to the, uh, the partners, um, trying to f figure fix things himself, but that doesn't work. So eventually he tells them what happened and then he lost the file and they go nuts. His father-in-law goes ballistic, he's chewing him out. His father-in-law's partner's like, hey, calm down. You know, I have an idea. Pulls out another file that they had from the same foundation that has the philanthropist's signature on it. And he very convincingly is like, we just replace the signature from here onto the, onto the power of attorney. So now we're talking about forging documents. He goes, it's not, it's, we're just taking something, you know, we're, we're, we're duplicating something that already exists that we've lost, you know, and he makes this, you know, convincing argument. And if I'm honest, I'm listening to that, trying to imagine if I'm in this situation and I'm like potential jail time and all this, I mean, goodness, how tempting it is. Right, how tempting it is to take the, the easier path, so to speak, and how nothing ever gets better. Nothing ever gets better when we keep just going down this spiral of sin, right? And so um, there's a line in there, look, I forget which character says it, you know, we want to continue the life we enjoy living. So there's a couple interesting things throughout this film where you're getting... Uh, a window into the motivations of certain characters. Like, how do they approach life itself? What's their guiding moral for life? Uh, and there's a few, and there's one I'm going to get to later, but that's one that's very obvious. You know, a very honest character who's very morally compromised who just says, we want to enjoy living the life that we've, we've been accustomed to. So comfort, you know, trumps everything. I, you know, I just, I do whatever it takes to maintain this lifestyle regardless of who gets hurt, you know, the carnage in the way. There's so many things throughout this Catholic imagery. I said it's Good Friday. You know, you'll see zoom-ins, like just a, a, a like a five-second shot on a cab's um, rearview mirror rosary. They didn't have to shoot that. Why'd they shoot that, you know? Um, Gavin ends up drifting in his desperation at one point into a church during the Passion ce uh, Celebration on Good Friday. And there's not room to sit, so he goes and he sits in a confessional. And he ends up having this not exactly confession, but kind of, you know, very frustrated, you know, vent session in the, in the confessional, which is a really interesting scene. Uh, Doyle at one point um, kind of manages to meet up with his, his, his wife or his maybe ex-wife. It's not entirely clear. I think it is his ex-wife. Um, and she agrees to see this house that he was excited that he was trying to buy that's kind of gotten ruined now in his, all of his plans. And she goes and looks at it and... You know, the plans are moving in a different direction, but they're kind of cordial for the scene. And as they're talking, the camera just swings over and just shows in the background this empty closet. Totally empty closet, this dilapidated house, and there's a hanger hanging up and a big old picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in the closet. You know, and you just see it in the background, like, why? Why? You know? So these things don't happen by mistake. I don't know. I couldn't find anything in my research about a really specific, you know, Catholic or, or, or broader Christian you know, kind of, um, 
motivation for the film that was expressed by the filmmakers, but it's definitely there, whether they, how much they meant it or not. And so these, these faith themes, these, these questions that we should be asking ourselves about, where would you go with this? Would you continue down this line? Um, ben Affleck gets desperate at one point. He goes to a guy who gets things done to put pressure on Samuel Jackson's character by turning off his credit and completely bankrupting him by some sort of computer hacking uh, magic. And that's pretty nefarious. That character is, is interesting. Um, I always forget the guy's name. Um, let me look here quick. It is... You'd recognize him. He was Peter Parker's professor, I think, in one of the uh, early Spider-Man movies. Um, oh my goodness, what is his name? I can't find it. You'd, you'd know him if you saw him. Um, well, I'll just keep looking as I go. But anyway, and um, goes to this guy, and this guy's super creepy. Uh, and just as Samuel Jackson is going down to the, you know, back to the bank to work on the situation with the house, and it's just no good, right? He can't get the loan he needed anymore. Um, it's It's a big problem, you know? And so... This is uh, just this this incredibly tense situation going the whole way through the film, and it's only about an hour and a half long. So you definitely should um, make sure you check it out. It's 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 not a super long movie. I don't want to ruin the ending for you. I want to kind of leave it there. There is resolution. Um, I don't know if people. You know, is it a happy ending? This is what my wife was asking me when we were going to watch it. I said I don't know how to. I was like I want to say yes. You know, but, but I don't want to set up expectations either about what you might think that that would look like. Um, but there is resolution, and I think resolution in a good way that, that involves accountability. Uh, it involves making the decision to, you know, uh, pull the plug on a particular sinful path because, it, it, you know, there's this recognition that it's never going to get any better if you go down that path. Um, ben Affleck at one point decides that he's going to turn himself in, essentially. He's going to write a confession about having lost the file, um, and he's going to do this before they send in the, um, hopefully, before they send in this forged document. And he shows it to his friend Michelle, you know, the other uh, attorney there that he was having an affair with. Um, by the way, I should say his wife is played by Amanda Peet. Michelle, uh, at the law office, who he was having an affair with, is played by uh, Tony Collette, and they both do great jobs in this. And Tony Collette's character... Um, she reads this confession, and she's annoyed with it because she says, look, you know, what about your father-in-law and his partner? You know, they were as, they're at least as guilty as you, maybe more so. In fact, you find out that they had worked out a secret deal that not only would their law firm be in charge of the fund, you know, this foundation, but they also get payouts themselves. It was very nefarious, you know, um, and they did indeed basically trick the philanthropist into this deal in the first place. He was a little cognitively um, unaware of what all this implied, what all it involved, and kind of went along with it. So he wasn't really in the right frame of mind to make this decision, so Ben Affleck does have a lot to answer for, and so does his, um, his, his law partners. Um, but she reads, you know, he reads this note, she points that out, and uh, he just very calmly, I love this line, he just says, They've got to write their own letters. Isn't that something, right? You know, I go to the confessional, and all these jokes, right, about how, you know, the, the, the old wives who go to the confessional, and all they do is basically confess their husband's sins. Well, I do the same thing, you know, of, of very easily being tempted to, and even if I'm not in the confessional, just in my day-to-day -day life. It's so easy for all of us, especially in this culture. Uh, I'm not responsible for anything. It's always somebody else's fault. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest characteristics of our modern age is nothing is my fault. It's everybody else's fault. It's, it's institutions. It's this person did this to me. This person's keeping me down. This person's doing that. Do those things happen? Yeah, absolutely, right? Um, but you're responsible for your actions. I'm responsible for my actions. No one can ever make another human being sin. You know, if, if you sin under incredible duress and coercion, God is infinitely merciful. You will not be judged for something that was not a free choice, you know. But that's not usually what happens. And, and that doesn't excuse sin either, you know. Uh, every one of us is, is responsible for what we do day to day. I mean, the overwhelming majority of things you do, the overwhelming majority of things I do are things 
you or I choose to do. There are influences, yeah, different things shaping that, but, you know, you got to own up. We all do. And that's a huge problem, I think, today. That, that is something we need to get better about, for sure. So responsibility, accountability. The theme of accountability, you know, you see it all over, all over this movie. There's that part. There's the accountability that Doyle, you know, Sam Jackson's character, has with William Hurt's character, his uh, Alcoholics Anonymous sponsor. Which, by the way, he's only listed in the credits as Doyle's sponsor. So he doesn't even have a name in the movie. <clears throat> but anyway, any rate, there's this, I, I think a big takeaway from this film is, is really sort of get this idea that we can't fix it. You know, you can't fix the world, so to speak. I, I can't uncreate myself. I can't uncreate, in a sense, my my fallen nature. You know, like we are, we are in this mess together, and we need the mercy of God. Um, when we try to take things into our own hands, try to take the law into our own hands, we try to uh, the whole desperate times call for desperate measures. It never gets better. You know, so. There's this just general sense of this need for a higher power, right? You know, so you could say like the, the kind of Alcoholics Anonymous um, creed in a way goes through this film in other ways too. You know, that, that step one, admit there's a problem, you know, this kind of thing, or acknowledge a higher power. These these different kinds of themes that, that are common in a lot of these recovery programs are kind of embedded throughout this film uh, analogously, which is kind of interesting. There's a scene near the end, too, I want to mention before I forget, and it harkens back to something I mentioned earlier, this this idea of standards, of worldview, of, of what guides people people and how they live their life. And there's a character who Gavin is speaking with, and this is like I said, I'm, I want to try to be somewhat spoiler or big end of the movie uh, re re revealing um, uh, wary. I, I don't want to do that. I want to try to avoid that. But Gavin's talking to this character who, again, is one of these morally questionable people, pretty much everybody in the movie, and who's very confident. And Gavin's talking to him, and, and it's like Gavin's getting this this revelation of, of the kind of world he's actually in and, and what it's going to be like and what it's going to cost him if he continues down this this path professionally uh the kinds of things that people he's around are into and are okay with and this is becoming this moral dilemma for him and the character is is very open about how things really work and how okay he is with that and gavin just says to him he says you know um how can you live like that how can you live like that and the character says just very, you know, um, confidently. <laughs> he's, he's totally fine with it. And I have it here. It's just a great line. You know, it's it's maybe the most important line I wanted to share with you from this just for, for reflection. He says, I can live with myself because at the end of the day, I think I do more good than harm. What other standard do I have to live by? At the end of the day, l listen to that again. I think I do less harm, right? I think I do more good than harm. Well, big deal. I mean, so did Hitler. You know, <laughs> like if we point to one dictator, one serial killer, one, um, you know, uh, huge, um, complete, terrible... Um, Conscience, conscienceless, conscienceless scoundrel in history who wouldn't say that same thing, you know? Oh, you, th so you think that you're great? Well, that's your, your standard of objective morality? Um, and the, and I submit to you that that's one of the reasons that our world is so messed up right now because so many people are living exactly that way and encouraging that. And it's very tempting, but that's a good question too to consider, Right. You know, who gets the final say? So, you know, you think you're pretty great. I think I'm pretty great. I can come up with a million excuses for all the little things I do. I can come up with plenty of excuses for big wrong things I would do. It's not hard for a human being to justify what they do, even up to and including genocide. That has nothing to do with anything, you know, about whether something's right or wrong. I couldn't care less what someone thinks. That's, in fact, that's one of my little little tangent here. One of my least favorite lines, and it keeps showing up in movies. I've probably mentioned it before. 
I just really hate the line because I think it's cheap. Um, he or she, um, they, they thought they were doing what was right. She, she thought she was doing what was right. Okay. Uh, who cares? I, <laughs> there are a lot of times I thought I was doing what was right, or I could have made an argument or come up with some excuse or justification to defend what I was doing. And deep down, and maybe sometimes not even that deep down, I was well aware that what I was doing was not the right thing to do. But so the, the way this movie brings up questions of just honestly basic objective morality, it's a very thought-provoking film for that reason alone. So the bottom line is um, when it was all said and done, there's a real you know kind of conversion moment, I think, for both of these guys. They both recognize that the path they're on is not going to end well. And before too much devastation occurs, there is uh, this move toward reconciliation. There's the opening of doors that's going to enable them to resolve this, to see this this situation resolved. You know, and that's all I want to say. I don't want to spoil the ending of this for you, but but uh, like I said, this was a movie that was just really was interesting to me. I think it was the last movie filmed, or one of the last movies filmed, major films filmed before the September 11th attacks. And so you see a little bit in the movie, not much, but briefly see a shot of the World Trade Center. This came out in April of, of uh, 2002. Uh, actually, I looked it up just a few weeks after Good Friday in 2002. I was a senior in high school that year and uh, didn't, as I said, didn't see it at the time. But it was a real treat to, uh, um, you know, have this brought back on my radar by my brother Joe, who I, I love and miss dearly. I really... Um, you know, wanted to be able to kind of offer this this review. It would have been better, I think, if, if we could have a conversation about it, you know, like we had had back at the time. But I did want to, you know, um, uh, offer this just sort of a memorial for uh, for him and just a uh, of, of, of happy memory and kind of dedicate this to him. So, uh, so thank you all for tuning in today. Please make sure you check out my website, thegraciousguest.org, for more content. I have a lot of really just increasingly awesome interviews coming up here pretty soon uh, that are in the works for the next couple of months. So keep an eye out for those. Other things you know you might want to see, uh, let me know about. Just go to thegraciousguest.org and hit up my contact form on the bottom of the splash page. You can just send me uh, a direct message through there, and I'll see what I can do. See if it's something we might want to uh, showcase here on the Gracious Guest Show. I'm Mike Creevy, and until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care.